Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time and joining this call. Thank you for your interest. My name is Faiz Ahmed. Uh, I'm the CEO of Hinduja Tech Limited. Uh, Hinduja Tech specializes in electric vehicle development, and we have been part of many global uh, EV development programs and have launched and supported our customers uh, right from concept to start of production. Uh, what I'm presenting today is a very high level overview of where the next gen power electronics is going, what are the semiconductors that are being used, and what kind of savings, uh, both in terms of power and space, we can expect. Uh, we are all familiar with the power electronic devices, uh, but this is a segment where a lot of thoughts are not given in general. I mean, whenever we are speaking about electric vehicles, if you look at the discussions that goes on, it goes on about battery motors uh, and, and so on. So it's a bit of uh, it's a sector which is uh, not fully understood, at least by the startup segments. Uh, and, and that's what we are trying to do today to understand how power electronics impacts the overall electric vehicles or XEVs as we call them. Just to get an idea of power electronic devices and where uh, they are currently with efficiencies or what is widely available today in the market. So you look at battery pack. Battery packs are right now anywhere between 95% to 99.5% efficient. So they are kind of peaking at their efficiencies. Uh, motors are anywhere between 80% and 96%. It depends upon what motor you use and what application you're, you're using. And also, what is the duty cycle? And application and duty cycle makes a very, very large impact uh, for motor efficiency. Inverters, DC-DC converters as chargers. And uh, when you're running the vehicle, mostly you are not using the charger. Uh, unless you are regenerating, you're not charging the battery. So from the efficiency perspective, if you look at that, uh, we, these are the efficiencies and we just consider their midpoints. We land at about 72% efficiency overall, uh, which is uh, not really great. Now, if we just change two of the main power electronic devices, which are inverters and DC-DC, uh, with a new gen uh, power electronics, which is based on ultra wideband technologies, uh, then that efficiency jumps to about 80%. And that's about 8% jump uh, in, in uh, the overall efficiency of the vehicle, which is very, very significant. And from the power electronics point of view, that goes from 84% to 90%, uh, which, is, which is quite significant. And while this is efficiency, the gains in terms of uh, overall power loss management, overall energy management is much, much significant. And that we'll see uh, briefly uh, during the presentation. Now, at first, uh, when we start the EV development process, we try to size the system. And uh, the basic initial sizing steps are we look at what kind of power is required, what torques are required, what is the energy management. And that is based on either a duty cycle, which is defined by government agencies or which are the standards, or it is based on your own application duty cycle. And sometimes it is both, uh, or, or sometimes it could be a very specific duty cycle that you may be able to use for a very specific application. Now, as you see here, there are very large fluctuation in the power demand, in torque demand, in energy requirement. So system sizing uh, is as much a science as it's an art. Uh, we need to find out the sweetest spot uh, where to put uh, these system sizes. And once you select these uh, motors, uh, all the controllers, DC-DC converters, uh, all those things need to be sized uh, accordingly. Uh, one important factor uh, is about the impact of acceleration. So here you can see uh, we are trying to achieve 0 to 100 kilometers in, in various timings, uh, starting with 12 seconds, and where your torque and power requirement are very low. But if move the same timing, if we want to achieve 0 to 100 kilometers in 7.0 seconds, the torque and power requirement is pretty much three to four times. So as a designer, we also need to be very careful when we choose the initial specifications for vehicle performance. It has a very, very large bearing on the system selection and hence the energy requirement and overall performance. Now, so far we have been mostly dealing with silicon technologies, but the new technologies, which are uh, ultra wideband semiconductor technologies, uh, other than silicon, which we're using MOSFETs and IGBTs, 
So MOSFETs were very, very, they have been in the market for very long time. Uh, they have, they are very inexpensive. We understand them. We understand how they work, how they behave, how they fail. There's a very good understanding on, on MOSFETs uh, as well as IGBTs. And that has been used in the industry for a very long time. The new technologies, uh, silicon carbide and gallium nitride, they have been in the market for some time now. And they are very, very effective, very efficient as compared to uh, MOSFET and IGBTs, if you want to operate at a higher voltage level. Uh, we all know that uh, industry has been moving to higher voltage levels. We started somewhere about uh, 300 volts, moved to 400 volts. Now there are a lot of new developments that are happening at 800 volts. And the benefits of moving to higher voltages are uh, obvious to everyone. Now, once we move to higher voltage level, the silicon carbide and gallium nitride, they have very, very uh, large benefits and, and we'll see them as we move forward. Now let's compare uh, silicon versus uh, silicon carbide and, and where they are. So what you see in the center uh, is silicon and what you see on the periphery, uh, the orange graph is silicon carbide. And you can look at all the parameters. Uh, the silicon carbide wins. Uh, however, if you are operating uh, for a certain application, silicon carbide may not still be the right choice. So if you are working on a high voltage application, uh, silicon carbide provides very high uh, band gap, uh, which, is, which is good for operating at high voltage levels. And, and similarly, the breakdown electrical field is, is very high for silicon carbide as compared to silicon. They are also uh, very suited for high temperature applications. Uh, because they are thermal connectivities and, and melting point support a uh, high temperature application. High frequency application, uh, while they are better than silicon, they are not significantly better than silicon. Uh, they are not like three times or four times. So there are other areas, uh, other devices which are available, which can be suited for high frequency application. So what we uh, typically recommend is if you are going for a high voltage or a high temperature application, silicon carbide is definitely a better choice. Looking at the characteristic of these devices, so you can uh, see the comparison uh, between uh, the IGBTs, which are actually quite advanced as compared to silicon MOSFETs. Uh, their efficiency, the new generation uh, efficiency, what is available today is somewhere about 95%, and silicon MOSFETs are somewhere about 98%. So that's a quite significant jump. Uh, you can do very, very fast switching uh, with uh, uh, SIG devices, and, and that allows you a lot of energy savings. So we are approaching uh, somewhere about 98% uh, efficiencies now, and, and hopefully uh, we'll soon some new developments again, uh, taking these numbers higher. Now, why silicon devices are run are, are more efficient and run very cooler uh, as compared to why, why their temperatures are uh, lower, they can withstand higher temperatures, their losses are low, uh, is here uh, about the energy that is used in switching. So if you look at the high temperature, high uh, current uh, loads, uh, let's let's look at 300 ampere kind of current. Uh, you can see that the energy required uh, for a silicon device is almost one third of what is required by a corresponding uh, silicon or, or IGBT. And this is the energy which gets dissipated uh, uh, as, as heat. And if the energy requirement itself are low, the heat generation will also be low. So this is one of the big advantage of, of such devices. If you look, want to look at a comparison. So here, uh, let's say we're talking about a small inverter, a five kilowatt uh, at a fundamental frequency of 16 kilohertz. And let's say that the first column, if you're seeing that's the base for volume, for copper mass, and for the cost. If we change the fundamental frequency to three times, we are able to reduce 70% volume of the device. We are able to reduce 85% copper mass. We are able to reduce 39% cost of the device. That's the kind of change uh, these devices can bring in. And today we always, packaging is always a constraint, always a struggle. And if you are able to reduce uh, the device volume by 70%, and uh, it's a huge uh, volume savings, and, and it will definitely provide a lot of ease to uh, packaging of, of these devices. It will also provide a lot of uh, thermal management uh, ease and then so on. Cost reduction is 40% if you just improve the fundamental frequency to three times. 
However, it's not always easy to move the fundamental frequency to three times, four times. Uh, there are limitations. Uh, there are limitations on motor design. So while we may not be able to move three times of fundamental frequency or nine times of fundamental frequency, but still uh, we can go up to 2x without major uh, changes on the on the motor development and, and 2x is definitely achievable and that itself will allow us a lot of savings in terms of volume in terms of uh, uh, cost we look at another example and, and this example has been prepared on a class 3 vehicle using a wltp cycle and if you take the igbt devices as a base uh, silicon carbide, uh, the power it can handle, which is 10% more power it can handle. We have uh, moved the frequencies uh, about 1.5 times. The weight of the device reduces from 15 kilogram to 19 kilogram. That's a 40% weight reduction. The volume of the device has gone from 14 to 10. Uh, that's 29% volume reduction. And the vehicle range uh, has improved from 159 to 177 because of the efficiency gain. And that's 11% range increase, which is very, very significant for a vehicle. And as I mentioned, uh, that these calculations will change depending on the vehicle, the application, and, and so on. And right now, uh, for this, uh, it, it's a 100 kilowatt power, uh, our powertrain, uh, and a class three vehicle for, for a given set of duty cycle. So, so that's about the uh, silicon carbide. Now let's look at uh, uh, gallium nitride as well, because that's another device which is very, very suitable for very high frequency applications. So if you if you look at a gallium nitride, now you can see uh, there is a shift towards uh, saturation velocity, which is uh, basically the high frequency component uh, of a device. And you can see it is significantly different from silicon. And that's what makes it very, very suitable for high frequency uh, applications. Uh, the efficiencies of these devices are somewhere at about 98%. Uh, however, these devices are very expensive and some of the failure mechanisms of these devices are not very well understood as yet. So while devices are coming on market slowly, uh, they are still lagging behind uh, silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is slightly uh, ahead of uh, gallium nitride uh, in industry adoption. Now, where these kind of uh, devices can be used? So if our power levels are somewhere between 1.5 kilowatt to 250 kilowatt, uh, these devices are very effective. So that means it will cover kind of uh, all, almost all of the power supplies, DC, DC converters, onboard chargers and, and inverter uh, for traction. Uh, beyond 250 kilowatt, is, it will still have some efficiency gains, some advantages, but they start to fade away. Uh, similarly, uh, the gallium nitride advantages start to fade when you are operating below 1.5 kilowatt. Uh, in terms of voltage level, uh, the really sweet spot for these voltages are 600 to 900 volts. Uh, if you are operating, uh, these devices will very efficiently. Above that, uh, uh, it starts to lose its advantage. And below 600 volt, uh, there are no significant advantage of using such devices. A quick comparison. Uh, between these technologies and the industry adoption. So the first column that you see is the base silicon, and we have just put it as X. The device cost currently in the market is roughly 1.5 times for silicon carbide and three to four times for gallium nitride. Uh, the suitability of applications. So as I mentioned earlier, for high temperature and high voltage applications, uh, silicon carbide is a great choice. But for high frequency, while silicon carbide is better than silicon, Gallium nitride is a better choice. We can withstand about 150 degree centigrade uh, high temperatures with silicon, but it goes to 600 degree centigrade and 300 degree centigrade for uh, gallium nitride. Now, if you are able to withstand that, that kind of high temperature, that means the cooling requirement for these devices are lower as compared to silicon. And, and that is a lot of savings when we design thermal management uh, for the vehicle or thermal management for the power electronics. Uh, efficiencies, you can see the power densities are almost twice of silicon. There is a huge size reduction of the devices of 30 to 40 percent is always possible and weight reduction of uh, about 70 percent possible if you are operating in uh, the high power, uh, high voltage uh, zones. Driving range, uh, I mean 11 percent uh, that are one specific case, but definitely we have seen a very large amount of driving range increase if you are able to use 
ultra wideband technologies for these. However, these devices come with uh, certain challenges. Uh, we are using, they have to be used at high voltage level. And when we switch to high voltage level, there are challenges in terms of safety. Uh, and that has to be taken into account. Uh, and these devices are smaller, quite small as compared to their counterparts in silicon. So they they have very uh, large issues on EMI, EMC compliance uh, and, and such things at a circuit board level. So the board design definitely becomes slightly more complex uh, for, for such devices. Industry has been very quick to adopt these things and you will see in the current year or probably in the next year, a lot of new devices coming from various manufacturers uh, in the market. So for example, uh, Delphi, ZF, uh, Hitachi, they have been developing a lot of new uh, systems, uh, EV subsystems uh, using these ultra wideband technologies. And we will see that those devices are likely to be sit significantly lower in weight, uh, significantly lower in terms of volume, uh, the packaging volume for the vehicle. They may not be cheaper at, at the moment uh, uh, because these are still in short supply and they are yet to pick up volumes. But uh, in future, we are seeing that the cost of such devices should come very close to the, the silicon cost uh, as we move forward and the adoption increases. This was a very high level overview of uh, where the industry is moving uh, in terms of uh, power electronic devices and where the semiconductor industry is moving. And please feel free to get in touch with us uh, if you need more information on how to implement such things and, and how to get the best out of your electric vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.